Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Regroup Show. I am your host, LJ Walker, a real estate investor helping you realize your dreams of owning a home or investing in one. One question that I've been seeing a lot lately on lately on social media is how do I get started in real estate investing? Well, that question is really, really broad. You see, because there are many different real estate strategies that are out there. So I would advise you this. The first thing you should do is take a self-assessment of yourself. You want to ask yourself the following questions. How much time do I have? How much time do I want to spend? How much money do I have? How much money do I want to spend? And then lastly, what is my tolerance level? And let me give you some examples because I have tried a number of different real estate strategies. So I'm going to just share with you some of my experiences. Okay. In the beginning as a small landlord, yes, I did read a lot of books in the library. I took a lot of free classes that were given around New York City. I went to a lot of workshops, seminars uh, that the banks held to educate myself. Education is one thing. Experience is a whole nother ball of wax when it comes to real estate. You see, uh, well, first, let me be begin by saying this. As a small landlord, especially when you're first starting out on your first property, it's best to have good credit. Yes, you can buy property on bad credit, but banks uh, tend to charge you a higher interest rate the lower your score is. The next thing is there are some banks that if your score is too low, they won't even bother looking at you. So it is pretty crucial that you try and see if you can fix your credit, all right? And credit is fixable. Some people seem to think that it's not, but it is. The next thing uh, that you will need is money, okay? Especially in New York City. Yes, there are grants to help you buy property. However, there is gonna be some money that needs to come out of your pocket to number one, buy the property, and number two, maintain the property, all right? So uh, money is definitely um, an asset when it comes to being a landlord. The next thing is this, being a landlord can be very time consuming, especially for those of you who are starting out because you may not know yourself as a landlord yet. You might not pick the right tenants, for example. It took me a while before I could figure out, okay, I don't have to have anybody living with me. I can, cho I can choose better. Uh, now, yes, the laws have changed. But you can still look at someone's income and make sure when you're looking at their bank statements that they make enough money to pay your rent at least. You can also determine by their profession. Now, see, I work at night, so I need to be able to sleep. I live in one unit. I rent the other units out. I can't have somebody who is a dancer or a piano player as a profession living living in my home. And in my state and in many states, if you occupy one unit, you can, to a certain degree, discriminate who you rent to. You don't have to rent to anybody, all right? That is also a big misconception and a big myth that's um, spread out there. You also, uh, when you work at night, you can't deal with somebody who has a dog because dogs bark, they make a lot of noise. So that's not, that's not going to be compatible with my lifestyle. Now, if for the multifamilies, 
that are that I don't live in that's different in those cases no I cannot discriminate in those cases yes I I can have someone who's a dancer or a piano player uh, in those particular homes but the one that I live in if I don't want them here I don't have to now as also when it comes to uh, those properties that I don't live in I can choose whether or not I want a dog or not or or allow pets you see some people will not allow pets even in properties that they don't live in why because some people not all but some people with pets are careless and they don't want their property be, to be messed up other people will go ahead and let people with pets move in but they will make them they will charge them a very high fee so again uh dealing with being a small landlord there are a lot of considerations that you need to deal with you also have contractors um, it took me a long time to find contractors that were both competent reliable and dependable sometimes I find competent but I don't find reliable and, and dependable sometimes I find reliable but not competent <laughs> you see so uh, that's another thing and even even when you find all of that you're still dealing with people you're still dealing with emotions there are going to be times when uh, you may feel like cursing someone out trust me that's not always the best thing to do because you have people out there that are vindictive and I have to admit I have a little bit of that and they may not curse you out back but they will do little things to you to get back at you let me give you an example I had a co-worker who um, her relative was the type of person that would curse people out they had some tenants in there and what the tenants did is they tore down the wall and they put meat in the wall and then they put the wall back up later on they began to smell a smell and they didn't know where it was coming from what was going on so there was some issue that they had I believe it was either plumbing or electrical I think it was electrical and they had to tear down the wall in order to replace and that's when they found that there was rotten meat inside of those walls so uh, that's the other thing is that when you're a landlord you have to err on the side of caution you have to try to be diplomatic when you might not necessarily want to be diplomatic that's why I say uh, you have to know what is your tolerance level and you need to consider that before uh, saying to yourself I am going to take this route in order to get into real estate right uh, when you're more established when you have uh, bigger properties properties that are uh, 20 units of more of course you're going to be dealing with a property manager as, as opposed to doing everything yourself property manager will save you a lot of time but property managers will cost you money okay so again you have to have that is something that you have to have if you're going to choose that particular strategy all right the next strategy I want to move into is flipping see a lot of people watch shows on TV and they see how much money is being made but okay yes you can you can make a lot of money flipping you can also lose a lot of money flipping especially if you do not know um, other strategies in which you can recoup your money okay and some of you um, may know this by watching those shows some of you may not when you're flipping property you have to deal with contractors 
on many of these shows, they show everybody getting along, but that does not always happen in real life. Sometimes you and the contractor, there may be some sort of conflict. A lot of times it's going to happen because uh, you don't understand their vernacular in their pr particular profession. A lot of times uh, you do have contractors who will overcharge you and then use a cheap material. <laughs> okay. Then in addition to the contractors, especially if you're doing a gut rehab, if you're doing a gut rehab, nine times out of 10, you're going to have to deal with a city inspector. Well, with uh, the properties, two of the properties I had, there was only one inspector for five counties. He went on vacation for three weeks and we had to wait until he came back from vacation. When he came back, we weren't the first house that he had to look at because there were other houses scheduled ahead of us. So flipping can be time consuming also. All right. Uh, and also when it comes to money, flipping can take a lot of money, sometimes more money than if you were to just be a, a, a regular landlord, right? Because you need money to buy the property and then you need money to pay the contractors to fix up the property. Uh, you may want to also buy your own material instead of letting them buy for you. So it is a money consuming and it can be a time consuming situation, especially if the crew that you're working with is a new crew. Once you have done it a number of times, it gets a lot easier and it also becomes a lot faster, but money is still involved. Now, yes, you do have people who don't use their money. They use other people's money, hard money lenders, private uh, lenders. However, many of them are cautious about lending money to newbies, right? They want somebody who has some experience. So if you don't have a partner who has experience, then your chances of getting or using someone else's money is very slim. Uh, you may want to, let's say, go to one of those courses that the gurus have, because a lot of times those gurus have lenders that will loan you money. And of course, the money they loan you is going to be very high. Uh, the interest rate is going to be extremely, extremely high. So just letting you know ahead of time. The next strategy that people... I find that a lot of people have heard of, but they really don't know that much about, and that's rent to own, which is also known as creative financing. All right. With rent to own, yes, you will need money to buy the property. You might even need money. You may need to also make some uh, minor changes to the property before you buy before you get a tenant buyer. A tenant buyer is somebody who is going to put a down payment, make monthly payments, and then possibly a balloon payment at the end because these people want to be homeowners. So you buy the property, you get the tenant buyers, and the tenant buyers often, not always, it depends on which, because there's like three rent-to-own strategies. Um, it's like little to no maintenance involved. So it's not really time consuming, uh, but money is definitely needed. All right. Next, tax lien and tax deed investors. I'm shocked that even today that there are a lot of people who have who have said to me that they have not heard about this strategy. But yes, it does exist. Yes, it is legal. It's the government that is selling 
text lean and text D. So I really don't understand why people would even say to me, is this legal? <laughs> like, how more legal can you get if the government is selling it to you? Well, anyway. The way tax liens and tax deeds work is uh, basically you go to the tax assessor's website or you uh, go to the office of the tax assessor. Um, now that we're in COVID, there are some counties that are not even having these auctions at the moment, but there, but there are a few places where they are having it. Anyway, it's normally the most least expensive way to buy property, all right? You are bidding against others and it goes to the highest bidder. You don't get paid though until after redemption, right? And the, typically I would say um, it ranges. Uh, yes, it ranges between zero to, I believe the highest is 18%. When it comes to, um, you're going to be paid every month by the government. But even though you're paid every month, again, you're not going to receive that money until at the end of redemption. Right? And then when it does redeem, you foreclose and you get that property back. That is if you want to do it that way. There are some people that don't even foreclose. They do something called equity sharing. All right. Um, and then when you foreclose, yes, it costs money to foreclose. However, once you get that property, you do whatever you want to with that property. You can do become a landlord. You can do Airbnb hosting, uh, you can do rent to own, you can fix it and flip it. It's totally up to you um, at that point what you want to do. But when you first buy it, the interest rate varies uh, by state. And in Tennessee, I believe it varies by county. All right. Next. The next way of investing is through mortgage notes. Now, with mortgage notes, you have both performing and non-performing. Performing means that the homeowner is paying every month. Non-performing means that uh, the homeowner has not paid in over three months. Now, mortgage notes, you pretty much you buy them from a note broker who basically buys it from the bank. I've also had people who, strangely enough, uh, wondered if it was legal. It is legal. Uh, if you are a homeowner, I strongly urge you to reread the documents that you receive during closing because in it, it clearly states that the bank that you got your mortgage from can sell your mortgage note anytime they want to. And guess what? They do. Okay. They do sell, they do sell your mortgage note. So mortgage notes differ because you're getting it from the bank. Number one, number two, you get paid once that mortgage loan is boarded, particularly a performing one you get paid immediately and you get paid every single month. Mortgage note interests are about 6% and sometimes a lot more, okay? Now, when it's a non-performing note, you will not get paid right away, okay? You may try to get it to reperform, meaning assist the homeowner in getting them to pay the mortgage on time. Or um, with COVID, we have found that that is not always possible because sometimes the homeowners have passed away 
and it has to go through probate if the homeowner did not leave a will. Okay, and then at that point, the court decides. But no matter what the courts say, that property pretty much becomes yours. Even if they give it to one of the other relatives, that relative still has to pay the mortgage. Okay, but we're seeing where a lot of the relatives don't even want the property. So what ends up happening is you become a homeowner, all right? When you become that homeowner, again, you can do whatever you like. You can be a landlord. You can turn it into an Airbnb. You can fix it and flip it, sell it as is, whatever it is. Uh, that's mortgage note holding. And mortgage with mortgage notes, um, especially if it's performing, there is no maintenance. So there really isn't any time that you really use with both mortgage notes and tax lien and tax deed. Most of your time is really spent when you are doing your research, when you are doing your due diligence. After you buy it, there's really not much else, not much time that you really devote to that. You pretty much just wait for the money to arrive in your mailbox or if you have direct deposit uh, that's that's pretty much it okay next is REITs real estate investment trusts these are basically ETFs mutual funds that are traded on the stock market these are companies that invest in real estate such as uh, student housing, forestry, office buildings, hospitals, etc., apartment buildings, etc. Uh, nowadays, you can get buy a REIT. You can buy what they call a partial stock for about five dollars. Um, and I have seen them. I have seen them. Uh, I believe the highest I've seen is maybe like. Uh, $5,000 on a REIT. There might be some that are more expensive than that. But what the beauty of REITs are is uh, there's no maintenance whatsoever. Again, the only time that you really spend on a REIT is doing your due diligence, comparing it to other REITs, looking at how well it's done through the years. And then also looking at their returns and looking at their expenses. You can find a REIT which um, only charges uh, less than 1% of its earnings. Okay. The REITs are, are low though. You, you make more money being a landlord. If you do flipping right, you'll make more money there than you would if you were to invest in a REIT. Uh, the next one on the list is crowdfund. Crowdfund is when you have people who want to buy a particular property or properties, if you will, typically commercial buildings like apartment buildings, uh, stores, uh, strip malls or malls, either way. Um, they basically pool your money together to purchase the property. Uh, the lowest I've seen is a hundred dollars. The average I would say is about 5,000, but on the higher end, I have seen particularly when it came to private crowd funds where they start at 25,000 and up again, no maintenance, but the returns, it's been my experience that I make more money as a landlord than, than uh, the crowdfund. I also make more money when I do the rent to own than, than the crowdfund, as well as mortgage note. 
uh, investing. So, uh, yes, it's less maintenance. Uh, again, there is some due diligence that needs to be done. So the due diligence does take time. It doesn't really take that much time, though. It, it should only take you um, a day or two at the most. You know, I mean, I, I do know some people who are really thorough, uh, but it really just takes you a day or two uh, when it comes to due diligence on uh, crowd funds, REITs, mortgage notes, at tax lien and tax deeds. But uh, even though there are no maintenance, their returns are typically lower. All right. Next, wholesaling. I see a lot of people flocking here because a lot of times the gurus say, oh, you don't need any money. <laughs> I beg to differ a little bit with that because let's say you do driving for dollars. You have to put gas in your car. That costs money. You got to maintain your car. That costs money you are probably going to be writing letters. Paper costs money. The ink used to type up the letter, that costs money. Plus uh, printer maintenance. So it's not totally free like many of the gurus like to say it is. Uh, it is time intensive. It, it doesn't use up a lot of money, but um, it, some money is involved. Put it that way. Uh, it is time intensive in the fact that uh, you are going to be either driving for dollars or looking through lists. Some people uh, pay for lists to look through. Uh, you you have to do get yourself a buyer's list as well as uh, look for deals and then try to match up the buyer with the deal. You see, so. Because it's intensive when it comes to that as well as networking, uh, I would say wholesaling, no, it, it's not as uh, cost, uh, it's not as ex uh, expensive as the other ways to invest. However, it, it does take a lot of time, all right? So after you listen to everything that I said, as far as what are the different strategies and them being time intensive or cost effective, the next thing that you want to do after you choose which strategy you want is you go to the library and many libraries are online right now and you find books on those particular strategies. Um, you really don't have to pay for books. Many libraries have books for free. Now, I will tell you this. When it comes to uh, mortgage notes, the library really does not have too much information on those. So you will have to go to, let's say, an Amazon.com and purchase books regarding how to invest in mortgage notes, all right? Then you also have schools. You have schools that are online right now that allow you to take courses in any one of uh, these strategies that I mentioned. Um, as I said before, the strategies as far as being a homeowner, being a landlord, you can get that for free. Um, you really don't need to pay uh, to learn that at all. Look in your state, look at the neighborhood housing services, your local one, contact HUD, call them. Uh, they definitely have programs to teach you how to do that. All right. Now, but for the other strategies that I mentioned, uh, you would you would have to go to a school where you would have to pay for pay to learn how to do these things. 
What is the benefit of a school over a book? Well, the thing with going to a school is that you get to meet people. And the more people you have in your net, uh, your network will increase your net worth. When you just read a book, reading a book is excellent. Reading a book is good. I am the type of person that can read and can learn and then implement on my own. The problem is, is that reading a book, you don't have that network. Uh, you don't get to interact with people because there's nobody there except for you and the book itself. So, um, to each his own. But I, I would say I would go more with the school uh, than with just the book. Next is after you finish your school, try and join a mastermind group. A mastermind group, again, helps you with your network. And also, in a mastermind group, you might be able to find a coach, a coach or a mentor that's willing to assist you. Because nowadays, you have some people who have these courses charging $25,000 and $30,000. I'm not trying to knock their hustle because... For some of them, it has helped people, and I, I can name names of who they've helped. But I will tell you this, I don't believe it's necessary to spend all that money to learn how to do some of these things, some of these strategies. I really don't. It, it's, it's, it's not necessary, but if you're the type of person that you really want your hand to be held and you want to get out there and get out there fast, then yes, go seek one who has a good reputation, okay? Uh, that has, and when I say a good reputation, I mean somebody who has receipts, uh, not someone who just say, oh, yes, they're a wonderful person. No, how many students do you see them with property? That's what I mean by good reputation. <laughs> okay so yeah so those are those guys those are basically my steps so in summary if I was to sum everything up is take a self-assessment of yourself after you take a self-assessment match up who you are with one of the strategies after you find out, figure out which strategy you want, go to the library, pick a school where the focus is on the strategy that you're interested in. Once you do that, then you pick a mastermind group whose focus is what you're interested in or one that is just uh, real estate in general, all right? And then from that mastermind group, choose somebody that can be a mentor to you and that can help you get your first property, all right? So guys, that's all I have for you for now. Hopefully, the information that I've shared will help you make smart financial moves. Remember, feel free to pass this along because each one, reach one, teach one. Bye for now. Until next time, have a good night.